From President Donald Trump to the deadly protests in Charlottesville to the debate about monuments, I sit down one-on-one -on -one with Rocky D for this special edition of Quentin's Close-Ups. And be sure to download the free Quentin's Close-Ups app in your Apple or Google Play stores. Rocky D. Yeah, where? <laughs> Don't let him in there. Get a metal detector. You know, metal detectors, I set metal detectors off. I have metal in my shoulder. Oh, remember, right. remember last time I was here right. with a sling on? Right. Well, it still doesn't work right, but oh, uh, I'm here, and I brought my 3995 logo with me, too. <laughs> so there you go. Yeah. Quentin, it's good to see you. Likewise, there's so much to talk about. Oh, my God. Where do we start? From Washington to Columbia. Yeah. My question to you as we begin this interview is this. Where is the State of the Union in your mind? Where is the State of the Union right now? Yes, sir. I think largely because of the uh, media arguments with themselves and the fact that Donald Trump won and is doing this okay. to the mainstream media, I think the media is doing a lot of harm to our country. Uh, everything from social media to the, uh, to the mainstream pop culture so-called news media. You can see what CNN is doing. They're, ex they're, ex they're, they're accentuating the negative. Okay, is accentuating a word? Uh, I just made up my own word. I went to government school. Um, yeah, uh, what they're doing is, is they're accenting, is that the right word? Um, the negative. You will see, like out in uh, Charlottesville, you'll see a group of two, three hundred people. Okay, that town holds 30,000 people. Okay, who don't go to those rallies, who look at that stuff on TV and go, blah, I gotta go to work. Right? That's what the most of the country is like. Most of the country goes to work every day, and they, the problems with them are their taxes are too high, traffic is too congested, especially, we know that here in Charleston, and they're not worried about racial strife. You and I in this room and in this library, we were standing outside waiting for the doors to get unlocked. <laughs> Did you see anybody fighting outside? <laughs> and we are right across, friends. We're right across the street from the manual AME. The shooting was more stunning to us than anyone. Because nothing bad ever happens in that church, right? Nothing bad happens on Calhoun Street. Once in a while, a drunk wanders down the street and bounces his head off a curb. <laughs> but it happens. And that's what I think the average American is concerned about. I think the average American is concerned about how the, the nation's laws are affecting their lives. And I think nationwide, I've, I've talked to people, I've done at least 15 interviews about the statues being torn down. Yeah. I just gave a speech a month ago or so in front of a bunch of mostly ladies. There were some gentlemen there. And they're from Illinois, and they were from um, uh, Indiana, and some from Florida, and a few from North Carolina. And, and, and that was it. And uh, they were wondering why everybody's tearing monuments down. And in their Chicago act, and they're like, Racky, why are they tearing down statues? We don't do that here in Chicago. Why are you doing that there? And I'm like, you know, that's a good question. Why are we doing it here? And as you know, we talked about this on the phone, I believe, Thursday morning. But as you know, Charles and John Tenkenberg said, hey, let's keep the monuments up. But sure. Add some markers to it. Two things. First of all, those monuments are worth way too much money. Let's use the Calhoun Monument as an example, because everybody knows where it is. Right. Uh, first of all, for those who want to tear the monument down, it is owned by the Washington Light Infantry or whatever company runs their finances. Right. So is all of Marion, or most of, Marion Square. You know, if you tick them off enough, and they're really nice people. They've got one, have you ever seen their museum? Yeah. They're right around the corner here. Uh, the uh, museum, they've got one of the best uh, armament museums of, of uh, historic stuff that you've ever seen. But it's not open to the public. You have to ask. Take your camera in there someday. Wait till you see this. And the original Marion flag, right. Francis Marion flag, right, right. is in there on the wall. There's only one. It's priceless. Can you buy it? No, because it's worthless at the same time, right? It's like the Hundley. If you had to buy it, it would be seventeen trillion dollars. If you, what would you, what would you do with it? You know. So um, the uh, John Calhoun statue. It's been there for years, almost a hundred years right. now, and it's up there. It doesn't bother anybody. I don't know anybody who walks by the thing. I'm hearing this now. This is pop culture myth. You know, like in Charlottesville, it's pop culture myth. That somebody walks by, looks up and goes, oh, and faints dead away like an old black and white movie, right? No, that doesn't happen. Calhoun is not up there because he's a slaver, or he was a slaver. He's not up there, as one lady told me, because he helped out the Civil War. He was dead before the Civil War started. He was dead 11 years before the Civil War ever started. 
He's up there because he was the seventh vice president of the United States. Right. That's why he's there. They put it up very high because people have always bombarded statues. Look what just happened to the statue of Abraham Lincoln in Chicago. I mean, some knucklehead poured some kind of accelerant on it and burned it. Now, how are you going to replace that 90-year-old statue? How are you going to do it? I mean, the person who made the statue is long gone. You can't remake it. Uh, pulling down the statue in Durham. Stupid. Why? You're going to replace it. That's like a $50,000 statue. It's insured by the city. Now, the insurance company has to pay off. Will they put it back up? I don't know. But looking at what happened in Charlottesville, and that's never going to happen here. So you Antifa, you Black Lives Matter, your friends at the NAN, uh, get that out of your mind. And you goofy white supremacist, what is a white supremacist? What is a white guy? I'm a Caucasian. Do I look white to you? I'm lunchbag brown. Where's my march? When do we get a parade? Quentin, when do I get a parade? Power to the lunchbag brownies. I mean, what am I supposed to do? It doesn't matter. We're all people. You and I live on the same street. We eat in the same restaurants. You even work there. I'm going to go to give you a big tip. Here's the thing. <laughs> here's, here's the idea. When I was watching the thing in Charlottesville, and then Trump came out with the statement that he did, I thought he was right on. Because first of all, his first statement, he was waiting for information to come in. You remember George Bush during the 9-11 attacks? Right. The whole he sat there and did nothing. What's he supposed to do? Stand up in that school in Florida and flip a magic switch? No. What he said to the person who whispered in his ear was, keep, right. me, keep me updated on this. And then when they came back in the room, he said, I got to go, kids. He knew something was up. And the same thing with Donald Trump. He's like, race riot. He's like, great. Here he is trying to deal with health care, the economy, uh, North Korea. Right. That little knucklehead, you know, North Korea. China, India, all these places are, are up in arms. Right. And what, what is he going to deal with? A bunch of goofy kids with bad haircuts walking around with torches going, uh, they're either yelling, uh, Jews are not going to replace me or you are not going to replace me. I can't figure out what they were saying. And he's got to worry about that. First of all, what is President Trump supposed to do? <laughs> is he supposed to stop people from screaming in the street? Um, there were three groups. There were three groups of people at the uh, and two sides, and when, and when Trump said there were two sides of racism, there there certainly were. There's nobody more racist than the Antifa, which, by the way, for those who don't know, stands for anti-fascist, which is really odd, Quentin, because they're fascist. I mean, they use the fascist logo. They use the communist logo, the hammer and sickle. They make a fist and they have the hammer and sickle in it, and it's punching whatever body, whatever they're mad about that day, which is always something. But there were, there were, so we're supposed to look at this according to the media, and we're supposed to say that the white separatists are any worse than the other separatists that are there too. You got Antifa, you got Black Lives Matter, who, by the way, should never have been there. They should have backed out as soon as they saw Antifa there. They should have said, uh huh, no, because Antifa isn't exactly on their side either. And um, so you got those two groups, they're racists, and then you got the white racists over here hopping up and down. And there were two problems. First of all, the media neglected to say that these groups are all the same. They're all the same. You know, my race matters, your do yours doesn't, right? And then the other thing was, the other problem was, is believe it or not, the white nationalists, uh, whatever they are, uh, they, with their bad shirts and bad haircuts, <laughs> they had actually a permit to go march. Mm -hmm. They applied and did all this stuff. The other group showed up just to start a fight. And the Charlottesville mayor, told them to stand down, the, the police. Right. And that's how the fight started. Who started the fight and the violence in Charlottesville? I'm here to tell you, and I've talked to three people who were from there. Mm -hmm. Two of them were just bystanders. One was actually in the march, okay? Two were just bystanders watching like, what? The same thing, same reaction you and I would have, like, oh, good Lord, what now? And so uh, I talked to three of them, and they all say the same thing. Who started the actual violence was the Antifa people. The white separatists, I can't remember the name what they call themselves. It wasn't the Ku Klux Klan. Okay. Because, you know, they, they, why, you know why the Ku Klux Klan wears pointed hats? Because they got pointed heads. The, um, <laughs> yeah, I'm not afraid of you. They've already threatened. Oh. Show of hands in the room here. Show of hands in the room. How many people have been threatened directly by nose to nose by the KKK? I have. I have a long Italian last name. Most of my family is Catholic. You think they like me? No. I, I, <laughs> I mean, we're the third cross burning up there. You know? So, uh, 
I, I talked to some people and they, whoever is calling me, stop calling me. And the, uh, the whole idea was that these groups should have never been allowed to get within 50 yards of each other. Mm -hmm. If the Black Lives Matter and Antifa people want to stand in their separate areas and scream, let them do it. Okay, but they, are, they also should be informed that to gather in that kind of a mass and, and be on public property, you need to fill out some forms and some permits sure. to get the cops out there to protect you. Right. And believe it or not, the white separatists and white nationalists, they did that. They, they followed the rules. The white nationalists were funneled down into, did you ever merge on the 526? Oh my God. You know how things go or onto a bridge? Right. Things come down to a tunnel. Right. They, went, they went down to this tunnel area and in that outside those area, that's where the Antifa people and a couple of Black Lives Matter people were hitting them with poles and sticks, throwing, I'm not making this up, throwing bags of poop and pee. Now, where do you get urine from? It's got to be your own. Okay, where else are you going to get it? They're throwing this stuff. The Black Lives Matter, there's a picture of a Black Lives Matter guy with a hairspray can, and he's flame torching some guy. My son had picture. Well, what are you going to do that? You, could, you know how seriously you could hurt somebody with fire? Look at it did to that statue. And that statue was made out of stone. You could hurt somebody with fire. Okay, I mean, you, you know, it's not like, you know, waving a flag in their face or something. So in this country, we've got to settle down. The fact is that everybody can have their say. As far as here in Charleston, about the problem is, oh, oh it went back to Charlottesville for, for a second. The mainstream pop culture, so-called news media, wanted us to think that the white separatists, the white nationalists, they're racist, and the Black Lives Matter people, well, they're racist, and then over here, Antifa, they're racist too. But the worst racists are the white guys. These are the bad racists. These racists over here are just racist. These are the bad racists. And I thought to myself, what an idiotic concept. If you're racist and you act on it, you're a racist. And that's all there is to it. It doesn't matter which side you're coming from, does it? I mean, <laughs> that's all there is to it. And here in Charleston, I think Tecklenburg had a good idea. What exactly did he say was going to happen? Well, he wants to basically keep the monuments up, but I had markers to it, I believe. Yeah, I don't know if you want to put a marker up in front of Calhoun, or even if you did, if it would get in the way. But what I don't like about uh, the NAN, our brothers, and, oh, hi, James. Me and you talk soon. And, and, and <laughs> oh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Oh, no if you want to put markers up there, you want to put your own stage, here's the problem. NAN, BLM, Antifa, okay, they never, they never say we should build something. They never say let's build something, let's put something up. They never do that. They always say let's tear something down. Do you know how much it would cost to replace that Calhoun statue? The vice president who's from this town, who, by the way, was a big arbiter of, of what the Constitution looks like now. He was a big law guy. I know he was a believer in uh, race, uh, what do you get, slavery and all that kind of stuff, but he was wrong. A lot of people thought that back then. There were black slave runners, too. I showed you the picture. I sent you the picture of William Ellison's house. That guy lived like a king. Mm. And now his house up near Manning is owned by a famous artist in town here. And um, it's a beautiful home and lots of land. Okay, lots of land. Uh, you were gonna say? Oh, <laughs> it's your show, man. No worries, you know me. I don't need a microphone. <laughs> you're not wearing one. Yes, you are. Uh, but the post story basically says this: Charleston Mayor John Tecklenburg will see to men not remove uh -huh. his Confederate era monuments. Good. They took so much time and money putting them up. And let's face it. I mean, I like statues. Okay, I like statues of monuments. I think tourists come here partly because of those things. If you don't think tourists are coming here to see Civil War and Confederate and even Revolutionary Era stuff, right. go to Fort Moultrie, go to Sumter, go to see the Hunley. Sometimes you can't even get a ticket to see the Hunley. And it's in a remote location because right. it's still in a research lab, right. friends, if you go see it. Right. And I made the joke the other day, and it's a great display. Have you seen it? No. Oh, you ha you have not seen it. Okay, me, you, that camera right there. Okay, I'm gonna take you through the hunt. They would love it. Okay, it'd be amazing if you see it. It's 160 years old now, amazing. I think, somewhere around there. It's from uh, you know uh, 1850, 1863, and it looks futuristic. Mm. And it's beat up. It's old. And so I, I made a joke. I said, "Hey, we don't need this here. Let's melt it down and make a bust of Barack Obama." And six people turned to me like, Arr. I said, you know, I'm just kidding, right? <laughs> I'm just kidding. So, uh, yeah, taking monuments down is stupid. 
I would like to impart this, this feeling to you, and this is something I say in my speeches all the time. If you... Somebody really wants me bad, don't they? If you... Here's what you never do. And this is a statement based on what a guy in the, in the 1300s had to say. The 1200s. I wish I could remember his name. If you ever... One thing you should never do is try to erase the history of a conquered people. See my time? You don't want to erase the history of a conquered people because when you do, that's when they'll come back. And you're seeing it right now. Even as you and I live in Charleston, before they took the flag down unceremoniously in Columbia on a knee-jerk reaction from out-of-towners and this knucklehead full, filled up on drugs shooting people right across the street from where we are, friends, okay? That guy, uh, and they took the flag down, before that, did you see lots and lots of pickup trucks with PVC pipes sticking out the back with giant flags flying off them? You never did. Those guys stayed in their own yards. You saw it once in a while, you know, especially on football day or something. You know, you see flags of all kinds. But that brought these people out of the woods. For weeks, I was calling Nikki Haley, Larry uh, Grooms, right. Chip Limehouse, even Glenn McConnell, right. who is the, now the president of this university right here. I was calling them all saying, do something, don't do this. You know, don't do this because it will bring out the worst in people. Things will get worse. So remember what I told you. If you try to erase the history of a conquered people, that's when those people will come back with a vengeance. And so you don't want that. Leave the history there. The other thing I'd like to say is, for those whose feelings are hurt by monuments and flags, I have two things to say. Number one, I simply don't believe you. There are plenty of things I find offensive. I don't like Brussels sprouts. <laughs> okay? But if you were to order them on your plate, I wouldn't go, ah, yeah, Brussels sprouts, yeah, vampire. No. It, things that hurt my feelings, I just look the other way. Okay? There's a lot of things I don't like, and um, I, just, I just go roll my eyes. And uh, the other thing is, is if you took down... Every monument or flag or plaque in this town that offended somebody, you, which would be every monument, right? How would that make anybody's life any better? The day they all disappear. Let's say they all disappear once. Here, every city in the United States. All the monuments disappear. I'm going to throw this in the garbage can. And, uh, well, you know, put it away, whatever. Um, if you make every monument disappear, here's, here's what will happen. Okay. Nothing will change. The people that were screaming, take it down, their life doesn't get any better. Not tomorrow, not that day, not in the future. Nothing gets better by tearing things down just because you don't like the sight of it. Not to mention, many of these statues are really valuable. The one in Durham was not. Okay. But the, um, the uh, Robert E. Lee statue in New Orleans was worth a ton of money. You couldn't replace it. The one in, uh, that they just took down, okay. they just took a statue down in, I think, Duke? Somebody got up there and pounded on his face with a hammer. You want to know something? This is what Muslim marauders do. This is what ISIS did, does. Have you ever seen the Sphinx? And not in person, but you've seen pictures of the Sphinx. You know why it has no nose? Because Muslim bandits, I don't know who it was, came by a thousand years ago and shot it. Or what, then maybe not a thousand years ago, they shot it with guns. They defaced the Sphinx. It used to have a whole face on it. They shot it up with guns and beat it with hammer. I mean, that's why it looks like it does. The wind didn't do that because the rest of the monument is still there. You know, I'd like to go to Egypt and see the Sphinx and the pyramids, but, you know, I value my life so I don't go to Egypt right now. Let me take you back to Charlottesville because the, yeah. uh, according to the Pulse and Courier, uh, Lindsey Graham said this, Trump missed an opportunity to call out hate-filled groups at the Charlottesville violence. So what is the opportunity he's talking about? He did do that. Lindsey Graham got really upset because, remember when I told you we're supposed to hate the white, white nationalists? We're supposed to hate the white national racism. But the Black Lives Matter racism, we give it a pass. And also Antifa, nobody understands them, really. And so we're supposed to give that a pass, too. One of the main things that the, uh, that the media was really upset about when it comes to the white nationalists was that they were marching around with those tiki torches. Oh, sidebar. You know what's really funny about the tiki torches? Home Depot had to send out messages going, Oh no, those are our tiki torches. We didn't give them to them. We don't support the white nationalists. 
No kidding, Home Depot. Really? Anybody can buy something at Home Depot. You can walk in now and buy it. You can walk into Home Depot with a I Hate America hat on your head and buy something. What are they going to do? Not sell it to you? So that's where they got the torches from. But they were marching around these torches, these uh, knucklehead white guys, most of them. And they were saying, um, they were. it looked like to me that they were saying Jews will not replace us. However, if you look at some of the other videos these white nationals have made, what they say is, you will not replace us. So were they saying Jews will not replace us? Or were they saying, you will not replace us? Or were they doing both at different times? The media gets very, very upset and nervous, and they pull the hair out. And uh, see, Lindsey Graham, up, up before Trump got elected, Lindsey Graham had a full head of bushy hair. Now he's almost both. No, I'm just making that up. Lindsey Graham has been in my studio. We'll get, and other uh, elected officials get super nervous anytime Jewish people are besmirched by a group in public somewhere. And it's going to happen if you're a group. I mean, you're a black man. Has anybody ever said anything rude to you about being black? Maybe not to your face, but you've heard the statements, right? You've seen that stuff. These people fly these flags around and stuff like that. When I used to deliver papers when I was a kid, I think I told you this one about the guy on the porch. I used to get up on this guy's porch because he had a hard one to throw the paper on. And I'm like, I'm a, I'm a 12-year-old kid, 10-year-old kid, and I'm trying to get this paper up. John, his name is John, up his narrow porch, and I missed one out of every eight times. So I had to park my bike in the snow, get up there and put it on his porch. And he'd always whip up at the door and say, hey, you little dago kid, get off my porch. And I'm like, okay, most people aren't like that. You know, and uh, I told my dad, who is first generation son out of Italy, and my dad just shook his head, just, he said, stay away from Mr. Erky. Stay away from him. He's not right. Later on, the guy died, and they found all kinds of uncashed checks in his house. He was apparently an heir to a giant cookie-making company, okay. but he was nuts. You know, he was crazy, crazy. Uh, but getting back to Charlottesville, there were racists all over the place, and why the National Guard and the police wasn't there ready to do something is beyond me. The vice mayor of Charlotte, uh, Charlottesville, I think he had to resign. He's not a teacher anymore. I don't know if he's on paid leave. Um, he was teaching a class. Did you see the, the, the video of, of him teaching a class? He taught a class where he had the word nigger written right on his shirt, on a big, on his shirt. I have the picture, I put it up online. I said, what is this guy doing? This is a teacher, there's much better ways. I tell people, including stand-up comics, when they get on my show or they get on my Facebook, if you have to use dirty language, then you don't have anything to say. Okay? If you have to threaten somebody, don't do it on my page. Don't do it on my show. You do it on my show, you'll probably get arrested. But um, if you can't, if you can't, like a comedian, if you can't do a, a, a routine without the F-bomb and the N-bomb and all that other kind of stuff, then you really don't have anything to say, do you? You know, all you're doing is cursing. And uh, by the way, that would put Chris Rock out of business, wouldn't it? <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. So when it comes to, to rough language, why do people use it? Why do the groups use that kind of stuff? You know, why do the Black Panthers set American flags aflame in Marion Square under a tree a couple years ago and then claim F the white people and all that stuff? Because they know by cursing they get attention. You know, and so people like me, I don't put that stuff up on my Facebook. And that guy wearing that shirt, you couldn't wear something, you couldn't just talk about it. You couldn't have a class about racism without being a racist. And then, that's the same guy. Um, his name was Wes something. I can't remember his name right now. Bellamy. Okay. He got let go from his job as vice mayor and from as teacher because he's the guy who was telling the city cops to stand down. Mm. My witnesses at the scene, the, the, especially the two that were on the side and not participating, they said the cops were looking at the ground, stubbing their toes into the ground, you know, digging their foot in like that. Right. Because they wanted to do something. It wouldn't have been easy, but it wouldn't have been impossible to get in front of the Antifa people and push them back about 20 yards. Get them out of reach, you know. They might be able to throw some caca balloons <laughs> or something like that, but they're going to do that anyway. I think that whole thing was handled wrong. And as far as Donald Trump and Lindsey Graham, Lindsey Graham's just trying to make political hay out of it. 
they are there is still a gigantic amount of people too big of not nah, gigantic uh, too big of an amount of people in this nation who are still upset that Donald Trump won. He won fair and square. And how did he win? I'll tell you how he won mainstream pop culture, so-called news media, and that includes you local people. By the way, kudos to Channel 4. Back time somebody waked up. What'd you do? Did you run? Did, did, did the liquor cabinet go dry one day? You said, oh, there's Quentin. Is that what you did? <laughs> anyway, so I'm glad to see you on Channel 4. <laughs> you, <laughs> it's great to see you there. Um, but what, how did Trump become so popular? How did he get elected? How did he get? Well, he appealed to the people that the mainstream media is constantly debasing. Your workaday guy, black and white, it doesn't matter. Your wrench twister, Mike the mechanic, Danny the ditch digger, people out there making things, repairing things, doing things. Okay, those are the people that went out and got their own family to vote, which is the same thing I warned Nikki Haley. It's a good thing Nikki Haley didn't run for election a third time. She couldn't. All the people connected to anything doing with history would have voted against her. Yeah, go ahead. And speaking, speaking of her, she said this after Charlottesville. She knows, quote, the pain hate can cause, unquote. No, she doesn't. No, she doesn't. Okay, a privileged kid with nice parents yeah, she was the brown kid from Bamberg. So what? I'm the white kid from the south side of Chicago. You know, boo-hoo. She also became governor. You call that people hating her? How do you think Nikki Haley got elected to governor? You think she didn't get the white vote? How do you think that Tim Scott got elected as a, uh, a black senator? For those who don't know, uh, Tim Scott is the only black Republican senator, isn't he? Right. And he's from the state of South Carolina. Ooh, the evil state of South Carolina. Um... How did he get the vote? Well, you, you get the white vote. Why? Because that's a big chunk of the vote. You can't win on just one section of vote. You have to get them all. You're going to have your huge chunk of vote available already. That you got them in the box, but you got to get the fringe around them too. It's like radio advertising. You don't just advertise to your base. You don't just get your base when it comes to ratings. You get the people outside. You might be tuning in and go, oh, that's interesting. That's how you get them. Mm -hmm. right? So that's how Trump got elected. Media people put the glass down, close the bar for a day, right? Yeah, that's media. And, uh, but realize that that's who Trump was appealing to, was the everyday man who Obama and maybe even George Bush made alienated. 